For Off the Block, I'm Vane Lips, and we are now joined by Jay Hosick as he is back from Canada after leading the U.S. Men's Junior National Team to a gold medal at the Norseka Continental Championships and a berth into the FIVB World Championship next year. And Coach, have to ask, you know, what was that feeling like over the weekend being able to win a gold medal against Cuba? Well, obviously winning a gold medal in Narseca is, uh, is is obviously a great accomplishment. I, I got to tell you, I, I give my hat off to my staff. Uh, my assistant coaches, Joni Carson and Matt McCarthy and Virginia Tram were uh, just great people to have around, and, and they they knew what was coming up in front of them, and, and they worked their butts off. And uh, and I got to give the credit to them. And you know, the guys the guys worked really hard. We. We did a little goal setting at the beginning of the whole thing, and, and the, the main goal for the team that they had set was they just wanted to represent the USA at the best way possible. And you know, I said, hey, if, if winning, you know, the gold medal is the goal, that's great. But what if you get silver? Is that okay? And they said, hey, if we if we do what we set out to do, then that that shouldn't be a problem. But we just want to represent the best way we can, and I think they did that. So I, I give a, I give my hats off to them as well. It was just a great team effort all the way around. And I uh, could not be more proud of the guys and of my staff. Yeah, now, Coach, walk us through the tournament here a little bit. You started off in pool play, maybe not necessarily playing some of the toughest teams in the tournament, but you took care of business against um, St. Vincent and Barbados. And I just want to ask, how were you able to get your team, following those two matches, get ready to play a tough Canada team in the semifinals? Well, the reality is, is Norseka is, is set up such that, you know, you've, you've got obviously the North, North America, you've got... Caribbean countries, and you got Central America, and, and you know there's some very good teams that are in that in that zone region. You know Canada and Puerto Rico and Cuba and Mexico; those are all really really good teams. The, the, the unfortunate thing is is that Puerto Rico and Mexico had backed out. I guess at the last second, I'm not sure as to the reason why, but uh, they decided to go a different direction, I guess. And uh, and so we went there uh, knowing that it was going to be us, Canada. And, uh, in Cuba, they were probably going to be vying for that championship to get that bid. And our pool was set up, uh, I don't want to say easier. Uh, it was just different. You know, we had, we had played a day, off a day, played a day. And then because we won our pool, we had another day off and then we got to play Canada. And that's, it's a pretty nice schedule in the sense that we get a chance to relax and kind of decompress. Uh, but you're not really in a rhythm. Uh, I think, and, and going against Barbados and against St. Vincent, we really just focused on our side of the net. We didn't care too much about trying to be overpowered. We just wanted to clean up things that we had been working on. It gave us a chance to give everybody some playing time and, and let everybody be a, a participant, so to speak, and, and contribute to the whole team's success and kind of figure out what our lineup was going to be for the next two matches, and, and I think we found it. So, um, yeah, you know, not... not, not not the toughest of schedules, but Canada and Cuba are not easy matches, and I, and I, I thought we responded well uh, when we got to that level of play. Yeah, well, I want to ask you about each of those matches. So, you know, let's start off in the semifinals against Canada. You know, um, in that match, you guys are able to win in three. Were you surprised at your team at all that you guys were able to win in three, basically playing in a road match against a tough environment in a tough environment? You know, I, I, I think I'd be a little remiss if I, if I said I was surprised. I'm really not. Um, one of the one of the things that we talked about as a group is that you know we wanted some things to be kind of standards for us. And one of those things was we were not going to let anybody outwork us in transition. Um, and I think you know we created a lot of opportunities in that match against Canada, for, especially in the first game, and uh, and we capitalized on it. I, I don't remember the numbers, but. We hit pretty high in transition, and that shows that we're working hard to, to get a good ball, a good pass off the big, or you know maybe off the soft block, or whatever the case might be. But you know, Canada, I think, was a little bit overwhelmed at first. We had a lot of good serves. Uh, we put a lot of pressure on them and service heat, and uh, and they didn't respond. I think as well as they maybe had hoped. Uh, but you know, that's a credit to our team. You know, we, we definitely. Um, we definitely took it to them. We have some guys on the team that can bring some heat. We also have some guys that have some pretty good floaters. So uh, I thought we did a nice job with that. So to be Canada in Canada, that's always a big deal. All right. And then, you know, obviously you played Cuba in the in the finals. We were able to beat them in 4-1. The standout performances, there were many in that match. But Kyle Ensign, 17 kills. I think he had like one error. What is that like for you as a coach when you're just seeing a player having that much success offensively? <laughs> It definitely makes me 
makes our job a lot easier, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, you know, here's here's the reality. Cuba, I think, was favored in that match. Uh, I think anybody who watched them play and watched us play, uh, you know, by no means would they have said it would have been a blowout. But I definitely would have think that they, they thought Cuba would be the favorite. And I, and I think we kind of went into it with the underdog mentality of, hey, we're just going to work hard and we're going to put pressure on them and, you know, we'll let the chips fall where they may. And I, and I think that first set kind of set the tone to the whole match, which is, you know, hey, we're, we're, we're here to work hard and, you know, you're going to have to do better than what you just did. And, and um, you know, we slowed some guys down. I thought our blocking schemes worked out really well. Um, their middle attack was not very effective and their, their outside pin hitters, they got one kid on that team, I forgot his name, but he was number 10. The kid just had an absolute king in front of arm. And we slowed him down a little bit, and that's all we really have to do. And I think once, you know, I, I think anybody who knows international volleyball, you know, they'll, they'll know Cuba. One, one thing about Cuba is they play really passionate volleyball. And when they're all fired up and they're yelling and screaming at each other and having a great time, they're a tough team to beat, you know, at any level. But they also work against them. You know, they, they start, if you start to slow them down a little bit, then they start to chirp a little bit at each other. And when they start to do that, that's when the wagon wheels start to come off. And I thought we did a nice job of not waking a sleeping dog and just kind of letting them get at each other a little bit. And that second set, we were down 11 to 17, uh, and we held them off and, and, and just chipped away. And next thing you know, we stole that set from the 29-17, or 29-27. And I think that was, I think that was a big turning point for them. I think they thought they had that game in the bag. And, you know, our guys just outworked them, and I was really happy with that. You know, I'd love to get your thoughts. A little bit of a weird hypothetical question, but, you know, with Cuba, you know, probably not many people see this team pl- play, you know, especially the average volleyball fan, college volleyball fan. So just hypothetically, you know, if this Cuban team that you guys play against were to, let's say, play in the NCAA, NCAAs, you know, would this be a top 15 quality team that they had assembled? I, I think without question or a top 15 team, you know, they could be top 10. Uh, the, the team they had a couple of years ago, we saw them in El Salvador. That would have been a national championship team, in no question. They were just unbelievably good. Um, but, you know, the team that we saw, uh, they had a couple of younger guys that moved up. Uh, they had some kind of challenges with their senior team I wasn't aware of. And, but, uh, you know, the thing about Cuba is they don't necessarily run a very fast offense. And they're not known for running a lot of trick plays. They just, they got a lot of power. And, you know, they, they hit the ball with some velocity that, that some of the guys, you know, see on a very rare basis, not necessarily all the time. And that's, you know, that's one of the, that's one of the things that we told our guys is they don't have to rush to get out to the pins, but we just got to be in good spots and blocking in defense. And we'll pick some of those balls up. And, and sure enough, that's what we did. But yeah, this team this year, Cuba, I'd say they were top, top, top 10 team for sure. Yeah. And, you know, looking at your team, one player in particular, Josh Tuanega, he was named the most valuable player of the tournament. What impressed you the most about his play throughout the tournament? You know, I've seen Josh play for a lot of years, uh, both recruiting-wise when he was younger. And, and I've, I've known his brother when his brother was, was playing club. I was coaching at that club. And so I, I know the name Tuanega really well. I think what Josh does really well is he's extremely level-headed. There's not a lot of times that he gets ruffled. Uh, and, and there were definitely some moments where, you know, maybe we weren't getting crushed, but, you know, things were getting a little awry. And you just look at him and he's just, he's just as, as cool as a cucumber can be. He's just kind of relaxed and, you know, he's like, yeah, I got the next one. And, and what you really like your setters to do, when there's a set made, it could have been the most perfect set in the world. And the hitter could have hit it out or maybe got blocked. It's just immediately, he's the first guy that looks at that hit and goes, hey, that's my bad, I'll get you the next set. And, and, you know, everybody around goes, man, that, that was pretty good as it was. You know, that might have been the hitter's fault, but he takes full responsibility and it takes the pressure off your hitters. Uh, and, you know, and when you know you got something like that at the helm, there's not a lot you have to do to adjust to that. I think the other thing that really, you know, sets Josh apart is, He's a great leader off the court. You know, he, he keeps the guys loose when it's tense. He, you know, he kind of fires them up when they're a little flat. Uh, you know, Josh is just one of those kids that he's real special to coach uh, and, and could not be happier for him to get MVP. I think that's a great a, a great person for them to pick. Uh, I, I don't think there's anybody better in the tournament that they could have chosen. And, and Josh is going to be one of those kids. He's going to lead Long Beach to some really good years up ahead, and, and he's going to have a promising career when he's done. So... Real stoked to that kid. Josh is a great kid. And coach, looking forward now for your team, you're going next season. You're going to be playing 
in the World Championships. You clinch that berth. And I know that, you know, these players are still developing, so especially this time in their lives, you know, there can still be lots of volleyball improvement. So, you know, I asked with that caveat, but is this probably going to be the, the team that we saw in Canada? Is this going to be the bulk of that team that we're going to see playing in the World Championships, or is that kind of still on the side, just seeing who continues to develop throughout the year? You know, it's, it's been my experience that the roster has changed quite a bit, um, and that's by no design of anybody. It's just a matter of who works hard in the offseason and gets better and, and who comes back ready to go, who's available. You know, there's been some years where, where some guys have just been not available for, for whatever reason, but, you know, I, I'd expect to see the bulk of this team back, and I'm pretty sure everybody's going to want to come back uh, as much as they can, so I don't think there's any... I don't think there's anything we're going to get blindsided by there. Um, but, you know, again, there are guys that didn't make the roster this year that are going to work hard this year in the offseason and, and try to get better to make that roster. I, I would say that next year's junior team, you know, it's going to be pretty strong. and There's going to be a lot of really good competition in all positions. So, um, yeah, I, I, I'd like to see this team. They were great to work with. Uh, but something tells me there's going to be a change or two here and there, and, and it's going to be a dogfight to get out of that roster. And Coach, I want to transition just a little bit because in addition to coaching Team USA, you're in really the thick of your first offseason with George Mason, second year in the program. What has, you know, kind of your first full offseason with George Mason been so far? Uh, playing a lot of catch-up and, and just getting on top of recruiting. You know, I, unfortunately, you know, I was the only coach that was really able to recruit. Uh, my, my part-time assistant, Joe Norton, uh, was coaching a club team out in uh, at JLs and was not able to do any recruiting. So, you know, we, we missed uh, the majority of everything, pretty much. Uh, and so that's, you know, luckily we've got a great class coming in this fall, but I, I think recruiting is the lifeblood of any program, and, and we're going to play a little catch-up with that. But, um, you know, for the most part, it's just kind of, you know, smoothing out the rough edges and, and, and dialing in some things that I thought last year we could do better and, and just kind of, you know, we're going to be in a new position, uh, this program. You know, I, I don't think that they've ever been uh, the favorite uh, for a long, long time, and I'm not saying that we're the favorite now, but uh, definitely we're going to have some bullseyes on our back that uh, that we're not used to, and or at least the guys that played are not used to. And so that's going to be a unique position to have, and, and it'll, it'll be interesting to see how we come out with that. I, I think the guys are, are cautiously optimistic, but at the same time know that they've got a lot of work to do. So, you know, the, the, the guys are turning... They're going to lead the guys that are coming in for the first time and, and, and kind of show them the ropes. And, and, you know, that's how it works with every program. So uh, we're excited. We, we can't wait to get back in the gym. Yeah, and, you know, one of the interesting things this time of year is you start seeing some of the schedules come out. I know George Mason last year had a daunting schedule. You know, are there any matches that, that you're looking forward to in the upcoming season, non-conference-wise, or are you still trying to iron out some of those details? We're, we're ironing out some of the final details. We got Loyola coming into the gym, which is great. We're excited about that. We're going out to Indiana, pick up IPFW at Ball State again. We're going out west. We're playing at the Active Ankle, so we got Long Beach, and, and I believe Northridge will be the other team at that. And, and then we're going to play USC while we're out there. So, yeah, and then the usual hosts of, uh, of you know cast of characters in the IBA. It's getting stronger and stronger every year. Princeton's going to be really, really good next year. Obviously, Penn State's going to be very good. I think Harvard's going to be good. I think St. Francis is going to be really good. Uh, you know, those, that, the fact that, that our conference is taking some steps necessary to become, you know, a, a little bit more respected every year, it, it no longer makes that conference kind of a weak kind of schedule. It's, it's going to be tough night in and night out, and, uh, and we're excited about that. So we're, we're looking forward to a fun 2017 season. 